Hello, everyone. This is Al Fadi. I'd like to welcome you back to another episode of this uh, series on Islam and atheism. In the last few videos, we have been using examples from Muhammad's own uh, moral actions, or in this case, immoral behavior, uh, to draw attention to that uh, and uh, correlate that to the notion that some of our Muslim friends are considering to become atheists. And yet, the reason for that oftentimes is their trouble, uh, you know, or at least they are feeling troubled, I should say, by the actions of the Prophet of Islam. And that in and of itself can create tension between how can you have a moral standard to judge the action of the Prophet, and at the same time, you gravitate towards uh, a worldview like atheism at the same time. With me here, uh, no other than Dr. David Wood, uh, who is definitely uh, the, the, uh, the expert when it comes to uh, atheism, given that he himself lived it and uh, is now a follower of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, he's been doing an amazing work, of course, in his own ministry. And we're delighted to have him here with us in studio. Uh, David, welcome back, brother. Good to be uh, here. Thank you for all the examples that we've been unpacking so far. Today, you have yet another exciting one. Uh, which one is that? Yeah, this is a this is a little lesser known uh, fact about Muhammad than something you know like Aisha um, or Muhammad and and Zainab, his his adopted son's wife that he that he uh, married. Um, this is about Muhammad's relationship with Sauda, which uh, has a lot to do with <clears throat> the idea of being committed to a woman um, in Islam, and so the. Historical background here is that Muhammad was uh, Muhammad was married to um, Sauda early on. So you know after after Khadija died, as Khadija's his first wife. After Khadija died, um, <clears throat> Muhammad's next two wives were uh, Aisha and, and Sauda, and Sauda was was significantly older than Aisha. But as time went on, um, she became older and older and, and heavier and heavier. Um, Aisha called her a, a very uh, large woman. Now, what happened was um, Sauda realized that Muhammad was going to divorce her, right? Because he had all of these other wives. He's marrying some of the most beautiful women in Arabia, and he's going to divorce her so that he doesn't have to keep spending time with his older, less attractive wife, and he could spend time with, you know, younger wife like Aisha or right. a far more attractive woman like like Zainab and, and, and the others. And so and we're talking about the the man who's uh, classified as mercy to mankind. Yeah. Mercy and mercy to all mankind. Yeah. And so <clears throat> she she starts fearing that Muhammad's going to divorce her because um, Muhammad had received a revelation, Surah 33, um, which said that no one's allowed to marry Muhammad's wives after him. Right, so she basically would have been a widow, and he would have given her some. He would have given her something for for the divorce and so on. But she understands she's about to be off on her own in her old age, and she didn't like this idea. So she came to Muhammad and said, "I have a proposal. Don't divorce me, and you don't have to spend any time with me. So don't divorce me. Continue letting me, you know, have my house and stuff like that, and you don't have to uh, visit me or have sex with me or anything else. In fact." The night that is dedicated to me, because Muhammad would dedicate a night, uh, a different night um, to each of his wives. The night that you would normally dedicate to me, I give that night to you to spend with Aisha. Hmm. So instead so it's of- It's all about sex here. Yeah. yeah. So instead yeah. of, uh, now instead of having his time, because Muhammad would, would divide up his time, would try to divide up the nights equally so that you know he's spending an equal amount of time with each wife. And now she says, well, if you if you, don't divorce me, you keep me, you can use my night for Aisha. And so now you get to spend twice as much time with Aisha as you do with any of your other wives. Hmm. Mom would say, well, you know, Aisha is my favorite wife. So that's, that's a pretty good deal. Wow. Good and sexual so, deal for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And so what, what happens is Muhammad, so Muhammad agrees, he remains married to Sauda, but, uh, you know, he doesn't visit her on, on her night anymore. Instead, he just spends, he spends more time with his child bride, Aisha. So that's the historical background. Disturbing part here is that Allah blesses the whole situation, right? Allah really likes this, this arrangement that they, that they came to. So uh, let's go ahead and turn to the Quran and see Allah's response to this, this situation. <clears throat> so this is Surah 4, 
verses 128 to 130. If a wife fears cruelty or desertion on her husband's part, notice, so, so this is talking about Sauda. If a wife fears cruelty or desertion on her husband's part. This is talking about Sauda. This, so, so this is Sauda fearing cruelty and desertion from who? From Muhammad. Do women really who are married have to fear desertion? You shouldn't fear that, right? Especially if you, your husband is the greatest pattern of conduct ever, right? Exactly. You should never have to fear cruelty or desertion from him. And notice, if you did fear him, if you did fear that, and you were to come to him and say, look, Muhammad, uh, you know, I, 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 I feel like you're, you're going to divorce me because I'm, I'm older and less attractive and you're not happy spending time with me and you want to spend time with your younger, more beautiful wives. I understand that. Um, so l let's make an arrangement here. The response should be, what are you talking about? I made a commitment to you. I'm your husband. I'm going to be faithful to you until the day I die. Nothing, nothing would change that. Nothing would change my faithfulness. You, you would expect the greatest man who ever lived to respond like that when a wife is fearing cruelty and desertion from him. Absolutely, right? absolutely. And that's the problem. I mean, I'm glad we brought up this example because uh, here is what's at stake right now. You have uh, the model for mankind, uh, the, the, uh, the role model for his own uh, Islamic community and the believers. Uh, here is a husband who is telling the other men in his community, it's okay for you uh, to feel like, uh, uh, you know, tired of staying with a certain wife just because, excuse in this case, what? She didn't say that she was misbehaving, didn't say that she wasn't really a good mother mm -hmm. or a good wife or whatever the cause might be. Even if with that, you know, what about just trying to work it out? But nevertheless, just because she's getting old, getting heavier, you're thinking what? Sex. Mm -hmm. She caught it. She understood what was going on here. Mm -hmm. So she offered him the night to enjoy sex with a young one. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's all about lust and sexual desires. Nothing more than that. Mm -hmm. That's that's uh, that's the story of Muhammad's life right there. All right, let's go back to the passage and then see, see what Allah's response is. So, if a wife fears cruelty or desertion on her husband's part, um, and we all understand that, you know, the correct response is not for the husband to rush in and say, no, 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 I'm not going to be cruel or desert you. That's not the response. Um, there is no blame on them if they arrange an amicable settlement between themselves. So if a wife fears cruelty or desertion from her husband, there's no blame on her. If, if she sort of runs to her husband and tries to come to an agreement, hey, don't desert me. Don't be cruel to me. I want to make a deal. And such settlement is best. Notice Allah says it's best. If you fear cruelty or desertion from your husband, in this case, Muhammad, it's good that you go and make a deal with him. It's good for you to go and make a deal, a deal with him, even though men's souls are swayed by greed. But if you do good and practice self-restraint, Allah is well acquainted with all that you do. You are never able to be fair. So now we have, we have the, the comment to Muslim, I mean, to Muslim men. You are never able to be fair and just between women, even if you, it is your ardent desire. Notice he says, you can't be fair. You're never going to be fair. So you, you have this idea that you're supposed to be fair to your wives. And then Allah is saying, so notice, Muhammad's dividing up these nights and stuff because he's trying to treat these wives equally. And Allah's response is, you're never going to be able to be fair, right? So he's, 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 he's acknowledging the agreement that they've come to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We understand you were trying to, you know, treat, uh, you know, Aisha on par with these other wives and you're still trying to be fair to Sauda and so on. But come on, come on. You can't be fair to all your wives, even if you're even if you're trying. So so give that up. All right. Let's finish the verse here. Verses. But turn not away from a woman altogether so as to leave her, as it were, hanging in the air. So don't, don't you know, don't just uh, don't just completely uh, abandon her. if She's willing to come to an agreement. If you come to a friendly understanding and practice self-restraint, Allah is oft forgiving, most merciful. But if they disagree and must part, Allah will provide abundance or uh, for all from his all reaching bounty for Allah is he that cares for all and is wise. So notice, uh, hey, it's, it's in your best interest to come to some sort of agreement and Allah likes that. But if someone disagrees, then, you know, don't worry, Allah can, Allah can take care of, of everyone. So if, if, if Sauda had had some sort of problem with the agreement or Muhammad had had some sort of a problem with the agreement, uh, don't worry um, that she's not even allowed to get married after being married to Muhammad. Eh, Allah will take care of her. Yeah, what, what a chauvinistic God. I mean, it's an amazing God for sure, you know. Mm -hmm.
I can see why Aisha was disturbed by this God who responds to his prophet immediately. Mm -hmm. How does this apply then uh, to our supposed atheist friends? Well, this is, this is yet another example of Muhammad just constantly receiving revelations that have no purpose other than justing his immoral, justifying his immoral behavior, right? Over and over and over again. And this again is why Aisha said, Aisha recognized it, Aisha saw it. She said, your Lord hastens to satisfy your wishes and desires. Meaning every time Muhammad wants something, he gets this revelation. He gets a special revelation. And so lots of Muslims who start recognizing these facts about Muhammad, um, your average Muslim who hears this is gonna try and justify it somehow. Uh, he's gonna try and explain it away. Well, your average Muslim has never heard this before, right? He, he, one, he's never read the passage in the Quran. The, your average Muslim doesn't read the Quran much. Um, two, uh, even if he reads the Quran, he won't know what this story is about. You have to go to outside sources and so on. So your average Muslim, if he's familiar with this story at all, he's heard it from us. He's heard it from someone like us because we're the ones who go to their sources and, and tell them what's in the sources. Their leaders do not do this. So they get their information from us and your, your average Muslim who, who hears it from us is gonna try and reconcile it and justify it and so on. But some Muslims are gonna, are gonna look at this and go, you know, gosh, it's Muhammad and, and Muhammad has a child bride, a little girl, he climbs on top of a little girl and he takes the wife of his own adopted son and he tells his followers they can have only four wives, but he gets more. Um, here, here, he's got a wife who's terrified that he's about to divorce and desert her and she doesn't know how she's going to make a living in her old age. And she comes to Muhammad to try and, to try and plead with him. Hey, please don't divorce me. Muhammad's response should have been, what are you talking about? I'm not gonna divorce you. What are you even talking about? But instead of that, Muhammad receives a revelation saying, good job coming to an agreement to allow Muhammad, my prophet, to have more sex with his child bride and, and not visit you at all anymore. Good job, good job taking that initiative and going and making a deal on, you know, right. to, to keep him from divorcing you. Um, lots of Muslims will look at that and say, there's something horribly, horribly wrong going on here. Uh, you should be, the greatest moral example ever should be treating his wife uh, better than this. The greatest moral example in history should not be receiving revelations that tell him to act in this way. And so this will be part of the reason that, that Muslims will leave Islam. But as we continue pointing out, for Muslims who leave Islam and become atheists, how then, how then do they continue condemning Muhammad's behavior when there's no, there's no foundation in, in atheism for condemning that sort of behavior. In other words, if you think right. about what we are given atheism, right? We are, we are um, uh, as Richard Dawkins has said, we're machines for propagating DNA. That's, that's, what, we, that's what we are. Human beings um, have inside ourselves deoxyribonucleic acid, and that sort of programs the rest of us, programs our, our body to become a machine for, for replicating more copies of itself. That's, right. that's, our, that's our real purpose in life. We can, we can have other limited purposes. We can get, you know, get jobs or find causes to fight for and so on, but our main purpose is uh, propagating DNA. So if that's what you are given atheism, what sense does it make to say that this machine for propagating DNA uh, shouldn't divorce this other machine for propagating DNA just because, you know, even though he's old and she's old, she's becoming less attractive and he wants to focus on his younger wives. Um, what sense does it make to say that's somehow uh, really, really wrong? You can say that you personally don't like it. You can say that you personally would treat your wife better than that. You can say that you personally think men in general should treat their wives better than this, but you can't say there's anything actually objectively morally wrong with that behavior. And so we just find this over and over again. You've got Muslims who are recognizing all the horrible and atrocious things Muhammad did. They're saying there's no way this guy can be a prophet when he did all of these horrible immoral things. They leave Islam. Many of them become atheists, not realizing that in becoming an atheist, there went your reasons for rejecting him as a prophet. Exactly. You're rejecting him as a prophet because of his moral behavior. But now your objections to his moral behavior, his immoral behavior make no sense given your worldview. And so we say to our atheist friends, guys, 
you need a new worldview. If your worldview cannot allow you to say that this man should not be having sex with a little girl, uh, shouldn't be throwing his, his wife you know, under the bus just because she got, she got older, guess what? That's going to happen. Um, that this guy shouldn't be taking the wife of his own adopted son. If your worldview does not allow you any basis for condemning that sort of behavior, you need a new worldview, and it ain't atheism. Absolutely. And let me tell you, the best worldview ever is to follow our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's see what Jesus himself said about the institution of marriage. He says, uh, the one who made them, speaking about male and female, Adam and Eve, man and woman, the one who made them said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and cleave into his wife and the two shall become one flesh. See, marriage in the eyes of God is not a temporary one. It's a commitment, a lifelong commitment. And then he proceeded to say later, what God has joined together, let no man separate, set asunder. This is the highest moral standard. That's the marriage that a wife should feel secure through, not worried and concerned uh, about her look, about her weight, about her size, and about a husband who supposedly is the model uh, to mankind in terms of mercy and how he should behave towards others. Give me a break. What kind of mercy is this that he's abandoning a woman, especially in those days, that she rightfully, you know, uh, uh, has the right, I should say, to be concerned because no one is going to take care of her. No one is going to uh, basically uh, provide for her. So she was out of desperation, willing to go the extra mile just to satisfy the lust of this model over the, uh, the fact that he, she was going to be in trouble. And probably she would have reverted to, pers uh, you know, basically prostitution to live and survive. Anything else uh, you want to add to this, brother? And what other examples, for instance, that are in the hopper for us? Uh, well, um, we continue going through, going down the, going down the line of Muhammad's behavior with uh, his uh, wives and so on. But we're about to take a look at his relationship with a slave girl. Hmm. Did you know that Muhammad had a sexual relationship with a slave girl? Have you guys caught the theme? It's all about women and Muhammad so far. <laughs> well, thank you, brother. And thank you, everybody. Until we meet again, have a blessed day. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. We can't make these quality videos without the help of partners like you. So please consider becoming a Patreon supporter today at patreon.com forward slash Sierra International. I want to make sure you always get notified when we release a new video. So please click the bell to be notified. And of course, make sure to subscribe to this channel. If this video was helpful to you, please click the thumbs up. Thank you.